Testing, is this better? Okay. So hi, um, I'm Alan, I work at Stamen. I'm gonna be showing you some, not quite work in progress, but stuff that's happening behind the scenes on some of our uh, work mapping social media activity in parks. Um, I've got the, a short link if you wanna follow along on the slides. And I apologize to anyone who was at NASIS. I gave a similar talk um, at NASIS a few months ago, uh, at the, which is the cartography conference. Um, and some of these warnings are more targeted for cartographers and some are more towards GIS people. So it's, when I say it's a work in progress, some of this is data collection that is ongoing. So some of the screenshots that I may be showing might be in, in the process of collecting some data. The cartography is still something that we're working out um, because a lot of the maps I'm gonna be showing are, are the algorithms that are ha happening behind the scenes as we're collecting social media for a user-facing app, which is actually not gonna include a lot of these maps in it. Um, so we're, we're making the maps that I'm gonna be showing today for kind of our own debugging of what's going on and we're still trying to figure out how they might be useful to, to roll into a more public-facing um, application. So right now they're just kind of for fun, kind of for looking at what's going on. Still working on how to do the legends, so the legends may totally be wrong. Uh, you should get just about the right idea. Um, Going to be making some wild observations about what social media is telling us about what people are doing in parks, but if anyone is a real scientist, you will of course know that you can't really uh, tell what people are doing from social media. You have all kinds of um, different act different demographic um, considerations about who's using social media, what you can actually collect from the public APIs and so on. So this is not science, and I'm using hex bins. Um, hex bins are maybe already a couple years out of fashion, but I'm gonna try to do something interesting with them. So before I get to any of that, some context. Uh, so at Stamen, we, last year we worked on this site called parks.stamen.com, which was mostly an experiment to see what we could collect uh, uh, of social media content in parks and other open spaces and protected spaces in California. And so we ended up with a site just to kind of make this stuff public and start a conversation where each park was ranked according to the different social media metrics that we're collecting, um, such as which parks have more tweets in them, which have more Instagram photos in them. Um, also you could sort by which are the, just the largest parks by area and so on. And you could also filter by parks that are within cities, various administration, uh, administrative boundaries. And we would have a page for every park. So here's Mission Dolores Park, and you could see some Flickr photos, see some Instagram content, you'd scroll down, see some tweets, and so on. So we were just really seeing what we could do, and we kind of had in mind what we wanted this to become. Um, and so more recently, uh, in collaboration with a few other people that I'll talk about shortly, uh, we we built this into an app. It's not really an app, it's a mobile, um, a mobile website called caliparks.org, which helps you find parks near you to do various activities and to see what's happening in them. This is in the context of the Parks Forward Commission here in California, which is um, a, a state-initiated in uh, investigation, like how to make California parks less functional, how to make them useful to more of the public, especially demographic groups who are not normally addressed in um, park planning, um, especially like younger audiences, especially Latinos who are a growing group um, within California and so on. So we built this along with the Green Info Network and HipCamp, combining some of their data, some of their, um, some of their data collection processes and so on. So the, the idea behind this app is that it helps you find a park based on the various activities, but we've got social media content so you see people actually using these parks. You might find out what's going on in parks that you wouldn't have known about otherwise. You might see people like you if you are an underrepresented group who's not normally um, thought of as the kind of people who are using parks. Um, and we also developed some custom uh, cartography that's park-centric, but I'm actually not gonna talk about that today. But it's really nice. Um, works great on tablet and so you get the sense that this is all stuff that is being pulled from Flickr mostly, but also Instagram, um, showing the diversity of different activities and different people who are using these parks. So that's the context. That's why we wanted to collect the social media. Um, and that's as far as we're showing so far. 
is these photos and counts of the different social media activity that will rank parks based on um, which ones near you might be more popular. But behind the scenes, how are we collecting all that data? And this is where there's a lot more that may be able to be drawn out of this project um, that we just aren't quite sure how we're going to use yet. So luckily, we didn't have to collect these park shapes at all. Um, there's already this great data set um, called CPAD, which collects every park, which is all the way down from federal to city parks, um, every protected area, so um, national forests, wildlife areas. It lets you know which ones are publicly accessible and which ones aren't, and so on. And there's 13,000 different parks or open spaces in this data set. And we wanted to find out, we wanted to get all the social media we could in every single one of these. So we started with these four, which were the most um, we thought would be the easiest to access because they all have pretty good public APIs. Um, they have different aspects of usage of a park, so people taking photographs, people tweeting in parks. Um, we could see the different ways people might be using parks. Uh, we have two photo sites, we have, so Instagram and Flickr, because they're both used quite differently. Different populations use them. You use them in different um, ways. You know, a bird watcher might be using Flickr, and someone who's having a picnic might be using Instagram, and so on. And each one of those four services we found, um, the way the APIs were made public, they were all different. They required different ways of harvesting the data. And they created interesting algorithms, interesting patterns as we tried to get the most we could out of um, these APIs. Twitter actually was the easiest. So we could just give Twitter an entire bounding box for all of California and, and um, collect tweets from their streaming API this was actually the easiest one to set up. Didn't really have to think about it. And we just get all the tweets. Then when we've collected them through the stream, we clip them against the parks and then throw away all the tweets that are not within parks, because we just don't want to store that much data. But for the other three services, for, for Flickr and for Instagram and for, um, for Foursquare, you can't just say, give me all of California. The API would not allow that. So the first thing I tried, which was a bit naive, was, well, I can take every park's bounding box and query each one of those bounding boxes. Um, and here, I don't know how well it's coming out on the main screen, but the CPAD data groups parks by the, um, the administrative entity. So it turns out there's a park call that's just run by all the BLM lands, so the federal lands that are like national forests, um, things out in the desert. And that, park is about the size of California. So there's one bounding box, it's all of California. Um, I tried just ignoring that one, and then I discovered that there's another park, which is a national seashore monument that covers the entire, little fragments along the entire coast of California. So that was another bounding box that was going to cover all of California, and these APIs wouldn't like that. So that was obviously not going to be the right choice. You need to find some way to have reasonable size uh, query parameters um, for these APIs. So here's what we ended up settling on for Flickr. Just create a grid um, every tenth of a degree. Flickr found that bounding box to be small enough to deal with. The API didn't, um, didn't choke on me. And I could just um, hit that bounding box as many times as I needed to to collect all of the photos that are within that bounding box. And then discard the ones after clipping them against the park shapes. So here we just see the number, the, the number of um, pages of hitting the API for each square. And you'll see that there's a few squares that I don't even bother querying because they don't intersect a park at all. And I knew that I would be throwing out all the social media in those. So nice, good job, Flickr. That was a pretty easy API to deal with. Foursquare is kind of the same. They want you to um, query a bounding box. So I took the, the, the grid that I created for Flickr I started querying Foursquare, but they return only 50 venues per bounding box. And if there's more than 50 in that bounding box, you're out of luck. They only give you 50. There's no way to like page through the results. So what we ended up doing for Foursquare, um, just if we hit 50, then we assume there's probably more venues there than they returned, subdivide those boxes, and keep querying smaller and smaller. So you end up with these 
increasingly small boxes, and eventually you have to do a sanity check so that you're not just getting smaller and smaller and smaller. Um, but you start to dig really deep around venues like there's little parks in downtown San Francisco where there might be um, multiple, like in Yerba Buena Park downtown, there might be multiple venues that you could actually check into that are within that bounds of a park. And it's all crammed in one really small area. So it would have to subdivide um, quite a few times. And so that results in a bunch of venues that we would then have to still clip them against every park. Um, and also about that subdivision, like we would, every smaller square we would test against our park shapes again and know that if we've subdivided into four, but only one of those four still covers a park, we just don't proceed with the other three. And four square is a little bit different from the other three services because we're not just collecting points, but we're collecting points that have a number associated with them. So it's not just photos, it's not just tweets. It's a venue that has a number of check-ins. Um, so we tried visualizing uh, how many check-ins are happening at these venues. Um, and you get effects like this, where, where you'll have a bunch of venues up in the upper part of San Francisco, which is the Presidio. So you have multiple places you can check in in that large park. And multiple check-ins are happening. A lot of check-ins are happening in those parks. Um, out kind of in eastern Oakland, you'll have lots of places you could check in, but fewer numbers of check-ins there. So later on in the slideshow, I'm going to be combining some of the social media collection that we we're doing, but I'm going to set Foursquare aside because of the way these points have values and it's harder to think about them in the same way as the other three, where it's just raw numbers of points that are scattered across space. Okay, finally, Instagram throws another wrench into, the, 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 um, into this process because they don't take bounding boxes. They take a point and a radius. So we have to come up with another algorithm for them. Um, so we created a hexagonal grid, and this is not even the hexagons that I was warning you about, um, of n kind of nested circles and blanket all of California with the largest possible circle. Those Instagram circles also do not page, so I get a maximum of 100 per circle. And so that means if I hit 100 photos, there's a good chance there's more than 100. They just aren't returning them through the API, so I subdivide. Here's some of what that looks like. And, and these ones, I'm sure, are snapshots from when it's in progress. Um, so there's only a few of those parks are recursing into smaller and smaller circles when you probably see a few more. This is Los Angeles. Um, this is Joshua Tree National Park, it's Point Reyes. And so some of these screenshots are, uh, most of those are coming out of QGIS. But more recently, I've been visualizing this stuff in CardoDB, um, which gives me a few different ways of visualizing things. And I can share those visualizations among other people in the studio easier than sending them screenshots um, from QGIS. So those same circles and nested hexagons that you saw, or nested circles that you saw for Instagram, these are the same ones, just visualized differently. And so what we see here are a hexagon, even though it's really a point and a radius that we were querying around. And the color is the number of photos that were returned from that query. So there's this giant hexagon right off the coast. So that was probably a circle that just barely touched land and maybe only had a few photos in it. But then in the, the middle of San Francisco, we have areas where the circle returned 100 photos from the API. So I'm not mapping those, because then I'm subdividing instead. So you'll only see the final depth um, of the hexagons. So zooming in a little bit more into Golden Gate Park, and the, which is that big linear park here, the Presidio um, up at the top. So what we're seeing here is we're, we're showing a bit of a, of a density map, but it's produced by the, the results of these queries. Um, so I could instead show you just a, a heat map of the resulting photos, but instead we're seeing this query kind of in process um, indicating density of photos by the darkness, but also indicating density by the size of the hexagons. So even if I wasn't changing the color, you would still be able to tell which areas are more dense because there would be more hexagons there. So this is just 
kind of fun, just kind of interesting. It helps us um, debug that the queries are working correctly and that it's recursing correctly and that these results are a bit, you know, what we would expect. Um, but it's also just really interesting and we're not really sure whether this would make sense to show to the public at all. Um, but it's really fun for us and we wanted to show it to you guys. Okay, um, but one thing I was wanting to do is to compare um, which areas are, have different types of the social media. So instead of just viewing them one at a time, um, what, are, what will it tell us if one end of a park has all of the tweets and the other end of the park has all of the Instagram photos and so on? How do we make those kind of comparisons? Um, so here's where I was using CarterDB um, and, and I'm gonna start messing with hex bins in a moment. So first I'm just loading the points in, so you know, totally default point layer. Um, I was playing a bit with the intensity maps, which is kind of a heat map in CardoDB. But in order to overlay the three different types, I was instead thinking I could do something with, with the hex bins. Um, so the, the, called the density map in CardoDB. So here is just one of the data layers. So this is just the tweets, and this is the default um, settings for the density map. I'm using five buckets here. But if I want this to overlap really well with those other uh, social media feeds, if I want to visualize them in the same way, I need these colors to be able to overlap. So I go into the CSS tab and I start to customize the style that CardoDB gave me. And instead of those, the color ramp that it gave me, I pick my own colors. And in fact, what I'm doing here, I'm gonna blend these three um, social media services using cyan, magenta, um, and yellow. So it'll be kind of a CMYK blending, like if anyone's familiar with more print mapping. Um, so what I'm doing here is I'm, I'm using an RGBA color. So it's a color with an alpha value associated with it. So every single um, bin of the, of the density map has the same color, but I'm varying how opaque it is. So that's that polygon fill um, you're seeing there. So it gets polygon fill, RGBA, 0, 255, 255, so that's the um, cyan color. And then the most dense area is a 0 0.5 opacity. And then where it's less dense, it becomes more and more transparent. But once you, once you start modifying the CSS in CarterDB, you have to modify the legend as well. So I just went into the legend um, and manually pasted in the hex values that would more or less represent the colors that are showing up in, in the hex bins on the map. So now you get that sense, less, more down there in the legend. Doing my best to keep the legends valid here. Um, so but what if I do that for all three and pile them on top of each other? So because of that opacity, we're gonna get blending of the different colors. If you are a, a hex bin that has a whole bunch of, say, Instagram, you'll be really opaque yellow. If you have a little bit of flicker, you'll be a mostly transparent pink or magenta. Um, and the, so those three data layers will blend together. And because I generated the hex bins with the same parameters in CardoDB, the three layers of hexagons all line up with each other. And if you choose different parameters and make them not line up, it looks really fun, but it doesn't tell you anything. Um, there's a, a short link there, so you can view this on our public CarterDB account and play with it and browse around if you want. So if we zoom out to more of California, so uh, the Bay Area is in the upper left. Um, that's the coast going down. Actually, the Bay Area is kind of in the left center. It's going down to a little bit south of Monterey, and then over on the right, you see Sierra Mountain Range. So you really quickly get the sense, okay, there's different stuff happening here. How do we decode this? Um, with our eye. So there's much more red and pink over in the mountains. That's an indication there's a lot more flicker in the mountains. It's kind of a yellowy red. So okay, there's flicker and quite a bit of Instagram, not a whole lot of tweets in the mountains. Um, and the darkish greenish, greenish gray areas are where there's a lot of everything in the Bay Area. There's a lot of all, the, all of those. But describing that color blending to you is not very helpful. So I photoshopped up a better legend. I don't know how to make CarterDB do this, but you know, if I, if I use this off enough, I'll build a plugin and we'll find a way to do this. Um, so this helps you visualize a little bit more what the color blending might mean. And so when we're seeing a lot of dark green, um, 
we can now look at that little pyramid legend and we see the green means a lot of Instagram, a lot of Twitter, not a lot of Flickr. And that's kind of what we expect in the urban areas along the coast. Flickr is a great service, but compared to the in number of users, it's like, like there's nobody using it compared to Instagram and Twitter. Um, and so then we see, okay, yeah, you can tell Flickr a lot in the mountains, um, Flickr less so in the urban areas relative to the other services. So zooming in a little bit more into the Central Valley, so the, the mostly gray area you see at the left is farmlands in Central Valley, no parks in our database there. Um, the green area is Fresno, I think, but you can see more of the details into the mountains where along roadways, and in fact, what we're finding is that really along where there's cell phone coverage is where you'll see more Instagram photos and more tweets into the mountains. Um, when you're really off the grid, then we really only see Flickr photos. People take a lot of Flickr photos, they come home and upload them and they, they geocode them, but nobody who goes out and, and tweets in the middle of the wilderness comes back home and sends the tweet with the correct geo tag from the, from the woods, it doesn't happen. Um, so that's why it gets to be pure pink, pretty much, pure Flickr into the really um, far off the grid areas into the mountains. So this is north of San Francisco, so this is uh, um, Marin County, um, there's a lot of pink there, which is more hard to access parts of the Marin Headlands. Um, it's, a little bit, it's a little bit fishy to me that I feel like there's a pink area that almost looks like it's the bounds of a particular park unit, which makes me think that there's something going on with the harvesting uh, at the time I took the screenshot. But it could actually be that that's the bounds of some you know, area that is further off the grid. This is the Presidio. And then you can even really zoom in quite a bit. And so this is great because CardioDB's, the hex bins are um, appropriately sized for each zoom level. So if we zoom in a whole bunch, we get smaller and smaller hex bins, we see more and more detail. So this is an Alamo Square park here in San Francisco. Um, and we see a whole bunch more uh, of all kinds of social media um, down in the lower right. But we also see more of the, um, it's a bit more Flickr and showing up only in that corner. Any ideas why we're seeing stuff only in that corner of Alamo Square? If anyone's familiar with Alamo Square? The full house, the full house houses, yes. The painted ladies, this row of, of well-preserved, um, attractive Victorian houses that you can, from this one spot in the southeast corner of Alamo Square, you can take a picture of those houses with the, the skyline in the background. So we're actually seeing almost like, you can kind of see a line here, where here you get that same shot, but also over here you can get the same shot. You just get different scale of the skyline in the background. So that was kind of fun to discover. All right, and I have a little bit of stuff that's not hex bins too. Also stuff that we don't really know what to do with, um, but is going to help us answer some other questions about how parks are useful, how parks are, are important parts of um, society and culture, but also of the economy. Um, we're mapping where Foursquare users check in after checking in in parks. And this is just something we're kind of getting for free when we're hitting the Foursquare API. So every time you query a venue in Foursquare, it returns here are five suggested venues, or up to five, that someone might want to check into next. So they've designed the API thinking that you're going to be building some kind of social media um, locative app on that. Um, so they're, they're giving you suggestions for, based on their understanding of where their users go, here are the places you're likely to go to next. And so we just collected that. We saved that. We're like, well, we don't really know if we're going to do anything with that, but what if we just mapped it? Um, and so the result is we, we have a lot of suggested venues that we didn't harvest because they're not within parks, that we're not, we weren't interested in for the purpose of our app, but we saved them. Um, and these connections, perhaps, something along this line, we're kind of going to keep working um, on this question, will communicate which parks have a connection with the rest of the city, which parks have a connection with other parks. Um, so here are the blue squares are the four square venues that we harvested from within parks. The size, I think, is the number of check-ins. So 
Um, some of the parks up there in the upper left are the ones in Fort Mason. Some of them are pretty popular. The blue lines are pointing to yellow squares, which are destinations. So those are the suggested venues that you might check into after checking into one of these parks in Fort Mason. And what we're seeing is there's kind of a, a ring of parks in the upper left corner of that park, a, a ring of venues in the upper left corner. So people are checking in at, um, there's like a bookstore there, there's a farmer's market, there's the Long Now Society. So you might check into several different places in the course of one visit. But you also, if you're a tourist, you might check in there and then later you'll check in somewhere else on the waterfront or you'll check in at the other end of a cable car line. So we see these lines shooting out from the park, um, going to various parts of the city. And a ton of them are all going to that one yellow square on the, on the waterfront, which um, I think is the Exploratorium. So another tourist venue that you might go to after going to Fort Mason. So here's around uh, Mount Diablo, which is um, East, in the East Bay. Um, in the upper right, you know, so we're seeing, first of all, there's much fewer four-square venues to check into out there. Um, but we're seeing in the upper right, there's multiple venues within the same park where you might check into a trailhead and then another trailhead or an outlook or something like that. So there's circulation happening within parks. But then down near the bottom, we're seeing a, a, a small city park, which is just shooting out to a small number of other venues within that same city. So maybe you, you go to a baseball game at the park, and then you go um, to the grocery store afterwards, something like that. So Alcatraz, Angel Island, these are, are um, significant tourist destinations. They're also places that you get to often along the same ferry trip. So if you're going to Angel Island, you're probably going past Alcatraz, so you might check into them um, all together. So you're seeing a lot of these bundles of next venues is what we're calling them. And even within Alcatraz, um, there, you might check in multiple places. Um, so you might think of which of these parks are, are um, full of different, different mental locations, or rather which parks are only a single um, venue in people's minds, or in terms of how Foursquare represents them. And sometimes you'll find a place that a lot of parks have in common. So we saw the Exploratorium before. Um, here's a place in the East Bay, Fenton's Creamery. Has anyone been there? Anyone from the East Bay? Yes, Lizzie, of course, yes. Um, apparently, that's where you go after you go to a park. So there's all of these parks in the East Bay, and almost every one of them, one of the possible five places you might want to go to next is Fenton's Creamery. So it's like, you know, if you go hiking, I guess that's the place to go. Um, and somehow Foursquare knows this. Foursquare suggests it. Um, so they might do well to start advertising in parks, you know, or they might, you know, have some kind of hikers special. Who knows? Um, this might be meaningful for them. So here's Land's End in San Francisco. Golden Gate Park. Um, and I said the yellow ones are, are ones we didn't harvest. Actually, I, I should correct that. The yellow ones are just suggested destinations, so they may also have occurred in our data set. So um, like up there in Golden Gate Park, there's a bunch of venues that are all suggesting another popular place within the park that you probably want to go to. Places like the zoo. So the zoo, in terms of the imagination of Foursquare and of Foursquare users, is not one place. The, the zoo is you know, the monkey enclosure and the elephants and whatever. You go to multiple places within the zoo, and when you're using Foursquare at the zoo, you're using it a lot. Whereas if you go to the golf course, you check in at the first hole, and then you're done, and you put your phone away. I don't know. Same thing down in LA. So um, that, that vertical area at the left is the Rose Bowl, and the Rose Bowl is in this ravine with a lot of other parks and, um, and venues, and those all are sending people out to, uh, mostly these were sports bars and restaurants in Pasadena that you like to go to after going to the Rose Bowl. Whereas Huntington Gardens down there in the lower right, they don't suggest anywhere outside the garden. It's all like, you should go to this other place in the garden. It's not an emitter, it's not, um, arguably you could say maybe it's not as connected with the outside community um, as something like the Rose Bowl is. So those are all, these are some of the specious observations that we'd love to do some more thinking about 
um, how can we use data like this or this data in particular to talk about the, the economic and social benefit of parks on the communities around them. The Rose Bowl is maybe not the best example of that. Um, and you can like zoom out and see like the connections along the entire beach um, in, in greater Los Angeles. So this is all still in progress. Maybe it'll be something, or maybe it'll just be this. Maybe these are, are going to be algorithms that we'll be able to put to use something somewhere else. Um, so please, if you're interested in the, the end result of it, check out Cali Parks, Cali Parks Org on Twitter. Um, the GitHub repo uh, has a lot of the harvesting scripts in it, um, as well as the stuff that builds the website. Um, a lot of stuff in there is still named park.salmon.com instead of caliparks.org. But dig around in there if you're interested in, in the harvesting scripts. The, the Python, um, we use Python to get the Twitter data, and it was just an off-the-shelf script. But for the other three, we've written um, harvesters in Node.js. So if you want to see how those stuff work, it's in there. And yeah, and there's a the slideshow again. Thank you very much. I have time for questions. Yeah. In your Python, your issues with hex bins? I don't know if I have ex issues with hex bins, but um, there, there's been a lot of critiques of he hex bins in that they are a, a a tool that was not really available a couple years ago, um, or they were, it was more work to create hex bins. And then now, CardoDB and other tools, it's easy to press a hex bin button, and then so suddenly we see a lot of maps with hex bins in the last couple years. And not that any of them are bad or worse than what you would have done with a heat map or done with something else. Like, um, I think just you know among the, the the chattering cartographers on twitter there's a lot of like you know another hex bin map it's and, and the people who people who are not in our world who see them for the first time are wowed by hex bins right um, so i think just as long as you're using them uh, and aware of what they're showing and what they're not showing then that's totally fine it's and in many ways it's it's better than um, it's slightly better than just putting things in rectangular grids and it's Slightly better in some ways than a heat map and slightly worse than other ways. So, yeah. I'm not so worried about you guys critiquing the hex bins, but those of us who are NASIS people, yeah. Um, yeah. I mean, I think they worked really good for this because they, especially the way that CarterDB was generating them, they let me have this uniform grid that I could apply to multiple data sets. So the fact that they're, I, was all, I always knew I would get the same hex was great. It was really useful. Um, that's a, I, the question was about, have we done anything with projections? Um, and I would say, for sure, we'd want to if we were to do any area calculations. So right now, we're not really doing anything to think about um, density of images or photos or anything like that. Um, but that being said, I, I have, for another project, been using CardoDB's hexbin function to create hexbins in other projections. And it's not that hard. Um, you, you do have to like type some functions into the, the, the SQL window um, and get, projection, get the hex bins at a different projection. But then you can save them, and then you can view them back in Mercator if you want. And then all the, the hex bins up at the top are extra big, and the ones at the bottom are small. But you can get them so that they will be relatively equal in area, which is useful if you, if you want a hex bin to be um, a, a meaningful indicator of density. Yeah. Yeah. Oh. Uh, so the question is, um, uh, have we done any mapping of the uh, people buying park permits or applying for permits? Um, no, we've not. That would be really interesting. And I, and I think that our, one of our collaborators for this project, Hip Camp, who is, they're kind of building a camping app that's hip, um, is, they're trying to uh, find ways to um, like be a reseller of, of, of um, permits. And so they may have that data. So that could be potential for further, for further collaboration. But yeah, I have not looked at it at all.
All right. Thank you. Oh, yeah. <laughs>